Apple Intelligence is here, but that's just the beginning. There are six other features that are so powerful, they even replace third-party apps. And the first ones on the chopping block are window management apps like Rectangle and Magnet. Because if there was one universal complaint about macOS, it was the horrendous window management. But now, without installing anything, we can finally drag windows to any side of the screen to snap them in place or use keyboard shortcuts. More on that in a second. And if we hold Option while we drag the windows, we can tile them even quicker. If we come here to Finder and go to the window menu, we can see all that's available now, including keyboard shortcuts for each function. And I saw a lot of people online saying they wouldn't switch to this because the keyboard shortcuts weren't easy to use. But you can actually change them to be whatever you want. You just need to go to Settings, Keyboard, Keyboard Shortcuts, App Shortcuts, and assign them under All Applications. You just need to add the shortcut name just as you see them in the menu. So if you want to tile them to the right, just type right and assign your keyboard shortcut. For me, I only use left, right, and fill, which fills up the whole screen without going into full screen mode. But if you're someone who uses a bunch of different configurations, just add them all here. And if we go into settings, desktop and dock, there's three settings that we can change here. I keep the first two on, but if they conflict with something you already do, you can turn them off here. And by default, the windows you tile have a little margin on the sides. And if you're like me and don't want that, you can disable it here by turning this setting off. Overall, this is a solid upgrade, and I think it's enough for everyone but the most demanding power users. It's definitely enough for me, so thank you Rectangle for your service. So that replaces third-party window managers, but the next one replaces Zoom. Just kidding, can you imagine? But for certain use cases, it actually might, because we've got a ton of improvements to FaceTime. And the first is that we can now share our screen. And when you do it, it even lets you preview which window you're about to share, so you don't accidentally share something you didn't mean to. Plus, you can give others control of your Mac to help you remotely. And this is great for those of us who always end up being the family's tech support. But that's not all. There's also presenter mode, which merges your camera feed with your screen, and it lets you dynamically adjust your position, as well as change which window you're sharing. On top of that, the sidebar now includes live captions. This is powered by on-device machine learning and it transcribes what the other person is saying in real time. This is great for those of us with disabilities and it's just one of the many new Apple Intelligence features and I'll go through more of them later in the video. And lastly, there's a handy new background removal tool that lets us choose from a set of colors, stock photos, or even use our own. Of course, this isn't the full replacement to Zoom, but there were plenty of times in the past where I used Zoom with family and friends just to use the share screen feature. But now we can do that and a lot more right here in FaceTime. But what might be a real replacement for a lot of people is this next feature, which is Apple Passwords. This is basically a first party password manager and we've actually had this for a while, but it was called Keychain and it was buried under the settings menu. But now we have a dedicated app for it on all our devices, which makes accessing it a lot easier. And let me tell you right away, this is not yet as full featured as some something like one password, but that gap is narrowing. Because this does a lot of the same stuff that a dedicated password manager does, and it even has a few advantages. It's a native app, which means you don't have to pay a separate subscription for it, and it works super well across all your Apple devices. And you can even run it exclusively from the menu bar. And to do that, you just need to go to password settings and enable show passwords in the menu bar. So what's the catch? Well, the biggest one is that you have to be all in on the Apple ecosystem for this to make sense. There's no app for it on the Google Play Store or on Windows. There is a browser extension, so I guess if you have a Windows machine, you can access your passwords through there, but that's far from ideal. You also can't share your passwords with others if they're not in the Apple ecosystem. And lastly, there's very little flexibility on what you can add to it. One password lets you store credit card information, passports, IDs, software licenses, and really anything, because you can also just create a secured note and put whatever you want in there. Overall, I think this is good enough for most people, especially those that never had a password manager to begin with. I'd love to cancel one password for this, but the ecosystem lock and lack of flexibility is a deal breaker for me on this one. Okay, so even though there's a ton of new AI features, there's only two that I actually use. And the first is mail summaries, because now when you get an email notification, it comes with a summary so you can easily see what it's all about. This is a great feature that gets even more powerful on the iPhone. And when you're going through your inbox, you now have a summarize option at the top that will summarize the whole email for you. 
very nice. All right, so before, if you wanted to have AI proofread your text or change the style, you had to either copy and paste it somewhere like ChatGPT or write in a software that had AI capabilities. But now with Apple Intelligence, you can get similar capabilities pretty much everywhere on the Mac. If you're using a native app like Mail or Notes, you just highlight your text and a little icon shows up to show you all that it can do. But this still works anywhere by right clicking your text and going to writing tools. And to take this to the next level, I also assign different keyboard shortcuts for the functions I use the most. And you can do the same by going to keyboard settings, keyboard shortcuts, app shortcuts, and then assign them under all applications. When this was announced, I thought it would only work on Apple's native apps like Mail and Notes, but this works everywhere, even on third-party browsers, which is huge because a lot of apps charge a premium to have AI functionality. But these writing tools are integrated system-wide, so they still work on those websites, which will make selling their AI features much harder. This could also affect grammar tools like Grammarly and Language Tool, as this does a lot of what they do. But I don't think this is a full replacement for ChatGPT, at least in its current form, as you can't chat with Apple Intelligence. But what could replace ChatGPT in the future is Siri, as that's something you can actually prompt and chat with. But we're gonna have to wait for Siri 2.0, which is set to come next year. And believe it or not, this is actually the feature I'm most excited for, as the potential is huge. Because unlike ChatGPT, Siri will have system-wide access, so it'll have much more context about you, which is going to open up a lot of possibilities. I'll be doing a full video on it when it comes out, so make sure you're subscribed. But in the meantime, we have a slightly improved Siri, and we can even trigger it via keyboard shortcut that you can customize by going to settings, Apple Intelligence and Siri and choosing it here. All right, so the Notes app also got some notable improvements, which is a long time coming as it was lacking some very basic features that even Evernote had over a decade ago. I can't believe I'm saying this, but we finally have collapsible headers as well as the ability to highlight in different colors. These would have been nice to have 10 years ago, but better late than never. It also now has audio recording, so you can record a clip straight to the Notes app and you could even transcribe that audio into text. It also has math notes just like the iPhone, so you can do different calculations and it will update the results dynamically. And if you want to take your math skills to the next level, I highly recommend checking out today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Brilliant builds your understanding from the ground up with concepts, which has been proven to be six times more effective than simply watching lecture videos. A great example of that is the course I'm taking right now called Applied Python, which teaches you how to use Python to work with text, which is what it's at the core of AI tools like ChatGPT. You'll learn how to read, analyze, and even create new text using Python. This is part of Brilliant's CS and programming learning path, which combines multiple courses into a curriculum that you can follow. And there's plenty more where that came from. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash from Sergio. And if you decide to stick with it, you'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. And a big thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. And then there's this new feature that at first glance seems like something you'll never use, but I think it's one of the stars of the show. It's called iPhone mirroring, and it lets us see our iPhone in our Mac, but it does a lot more than that. For starters, we can fully interact with our phone, which is great for those iOS-only apps. In the keynote, they showed Duolingo as an example for this, but the first thing that came to my mind was the Apple Journal app, because for those of us that use it, we can finally journal with our keyboard. I don't know why there's still no Mac version for it, but until that happens, this is a great workaround. And that's just the start, because you can also drag and drop files between your Mac and your phone. And you can even do it inside applications. And you can also now get your iPhone notifications on the Mac. And this is an independent feature to iPhone mirroring, and there's a settings menu for it that lets you decide which apps you want to enable. Unfortunately, for those of us in the EU, this one is still not available. There is a workaround for it though by changing your region under media purchases, but your existing subscriptions will no longer work. Hopefully this will be available later in the year. I want to also go over a few other small settings that are pretty useful. If we go to settings, desktop and dock, we now have a new option under double click a window title bar. Before it was only zoom, 
minimize and do nothing, but we can now fill. And what this means is if I have a small window, I can just double tap on the title bar and it will maximize it. And I much prefer this to the other options. There's also a new focus mode called reduce interruptions, which is a great use case for AI. And the way this works is that it analyzes your notifications and will only push them to you if it decides that they're important. And this is also available on all the other focus modes. Usually in my case, if it's an emergency, it's usually a phone call, but this is still a nice to have feature. We also now have the send later feature on messages that lets us schedule a text to be sent up to two weeks in advance. Safari also got two big updates. The first is that we can now summarize a page instantly by pressing the icon next to the URL bar. And if you're on a website of a public establishment that has stuff like business hours, location, and even contact information, it'll pull up those and show them to you here. But an even bigger update is the new Safari Reader, which just became arguably too powerful. Because now, on supported websites, you can just press the reader icon and it will get rid of every bit of advertisement. And you can even set it so that it always does it on a given website by going to Safari Settings, Websites, Reader, and adding which websites you want it to automatically be activated on. This is nice for sure, but I feel for the small bloggers as I imagine their revenue is definitely going to take a hit. I don't know, let me know in the comments what you think as this is definitely not a black and white situation. Some of these features overlap with iOS 18 like notes and passwords, but there's still a few others worth noting like the new control center. And I went over that and all the other iOS 18 features in this video here, so I'll see you there.